Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. to see everybody here on this amazing, beautiful fall morning. <laughs> like Mary says, we're a little thin today, but uh, you know, Jesus took 12, 12 years and turned the world upside down. We've got more than 12 here, so we've got something for us. Continuing on with the Minor Prophets series, today we're going to be looking at the prophet Nahum. And uh, if you want to turn to that, we'll I'll get to some of those scriptures in just a little bit. July 20th, 1861, uh, our country was just three months into the Civil War. And on that date, the Union and Confederate armies came together and, and actually fought one another for the very first time a place called Manassas Junction in Virginia. And this was the, the first major land battle of the American Civil War. Uh, it's known as the First Battle of Bull Run in the north. Uh, it was called that as the First Battle of Manassas, is what the South called it. The engagement began with Union troops having almost a two to one advantage in numbers, marching out of Washington, D.C. to attack a Confederate force along a small river known as Bull Run. And the Union forces that, that morning were utterly confident. I mean, they were gonna, they were just gonna whoop up on the Confederates and send them hightailing at home. The predictions at the time was that this Civil War, it wasn't a big deal, it wasn't gonna last very long. The Union Army with their amazing superiority in numbers and economic capabilities and manufacturing, all those things, it was just going to be brought to bear and we were, they were going to crush the South and that was going to be the end. They were so confident before this battle that it became a bit of an outing for the Washington, D.C. populace. And it wasn't just the army that went out, but families and, and men and women, they hopped in their carriages and their horses and they went along. And some even took picnic lunches to go and spread it out so they could watch, uh, so they could watch the route. And as the case was, they, they actually did get to see a route that day. It just didn't happen to be the one that they expected. Uh, after the fighting, after fighting on the defensive for most of the day, all of a sudden the Confederate Army rallied and broke through the Union line on the right flank and sent the, the troops, the Union troops, <coughs> along with all the picnickers in this chaotic retreat back to Washington, D.C. And this victory gave the South a, a huge surge of confidence, and it utterly shocked a lot of people in the North. And it came to, they came to realize maybe this wasn't going to be quite the, the picnic that we thought it was going to be. Um, Merriam-Webster defines complacency as a self-satisfaction, especially when accompanied by unawareness of actual dangers or deficiencies. And we see this cropping up often through human history. You know, I think we see it uh, this time of year on, on Saturday afternoons if, we, if we're football fans. Um, yesterday, the juggernaut number five rated Oklahoma waltzed into Manhattan, Kansas, and uh, left with their tail between their legs, so to speak. Lowly four and two Manhattan, Kansas just whooped up on Oklahoma and beat them by seven points, rather decisively. Um, you know, a week ago we saw virtually the same thing with Illinois and Wisconsin. Um, and you always wonder, you know, are these teams, you know, they're, they're so strong, they're so capable. Are they just kind of looking ahead beyond this, this opponent to the next big challenge that they got and they end up getting, getting beaten? You wonder if complacency was partly to blame. The prophecy of Nahum was directed towards a profoundly complacent nation, the Assyrians. And you may remember the Assyrians, that they, they figure prominently in another of the minor prophets, Jonah. Jonah was sent to the Assyrians, specifically to one of their major cities, Nineveh, in order to proclaim to them the impending judgment of God and their ultimate destruction. And amazingly, Jonah went in and preached, and amazingly, the Assyrians repented. The king repented, the people repented, and for a time, turned back the judgment of God. God relented and said, okay, and he, he withheld his hand. But something happened between Jonah and Nahum, and what happened is after 
the after the, the work of Jonah and this brief repentance wasn't long and the Assyrians reverted to form. And by that, I mean, well, the, the Assyrians really rate in popular imagination just about on the same level as maybe Genghis Khan, maybe Adolf Hitler in terms of their cruelty and their violence and their sheer murderous savagery. They were, they were terrible, terrible people. And historians, they tend to shy away from analogies, but it's, it's tempting to see the Assyrian Empire almost in the same terms as Nazi Germany. An aggressive, murderously vindictive regime supported by a magnificent, successful war machine. That describes the Assyrians. So when I say they reverted to form, that's the form to which they reverted. Cruel, violent, murderous, savage, aggressive, vindictive. You couple all of those traits together and add the most dominant army in the entire world at that time. And you have a recipe for a couple of things. One, utter dominion, domination. But also you've got a recipe for complacency. And they have mentioned several things in his book Several things about Assyria that would have contributed to this overconfidence, this, this complacency. In chapter 1, he says, Though they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. So he says, you know, Assyria, they had plenty of allies, other countries that they could rely on, and they were, they were a, very, a very populous nation. In Nahum 3.16, you have increased the number of your merchants till they are more numerous than the stars in the sky. Meaning that they were economically strong. They were an economic powerhouse at the time. In 3.17, your guards are like locusts, your officials like swarms of locusts. The city was well guarded. It was well administered. They had a, they had a system in place for taking care of things and for defending their, their town. And in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 5, men of a summons were picked, were picked troops, yet they stumble on their way. They dash to the city wall. The protective shield is in place. Their, their city was surrounded by huge walls, fortified walls, where the soldiers were able to be and defend them. And so virtually they were unassailable. Nobody was going to be able to beat the Assyrians. They were without equal in the, in the ancient world. And yet, as they basked in their strength, complacent and confident, they were brought down. The Babylonians came, destroyed Nineveh, destroyed the Assyrians, and ultimately replaced them in terms of domination in this part of the world at this time. So it's to the Assyrians that Nahum is addressed, in a sense, to this nation secure in their power, completely complacent, completely untouchable, Nahum addresses his prophecies. But even though he, he addresses his prophecies towards them and towards the Assyrians, Nahum's really, real audience was the people of Judah. They were the people who were going to hear these prophecies. They were going to be the people that Nahum preached to. And in this way, he's a little bit like Obadiah, who prophesied, prophesied against Edom, while at the same time really directing the words to the people of God. And for that reason, I think, even though you know, we're talking about a, a nation long ago in a, in a galaxy far, far away kind of thing, there is some real application in our own lives to what Nahum is talking about here. Um, there's warnings and there's, there's encouragement for God's people at all times and in all places. So today I'd like to talk about this idea of complacency, overconfidence, how it can affect us today, how it can affect our ministry, how it can affect our lives, and how we can guard against it. Now I'll start off, the New Testament gives us several examples of complacency or overconfidence and how it affected people. One of these is in uh, Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29 where the overconfident, complacent disciples were not able to cast out a demon. Now, I'll read just part of this. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing about, he asked. 
I mean, and the crowd answers, Teacher, I brought my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him and throws him to the ground, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? <coughs> he replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. Now to put this in a little bit of context, the disciples, Jesus had just sent the disciples out, as you read through Luke, to, to, for their first ministry. Two by two, they went out, they uh, preached, they healed, they cast out demons, they went town to town just sharing about the gospel, sharing about the kingdom of God. And then they returned to Jesus on this amazing, incredible high, having done and experienced things having a level of spiritual power that was beyond their imagination. I mean, imagine if, if you and I were to go out into Orient or go out into the towns and, and we were able to lay our hands and see people healed and see people raised from the dead and see demons cast out. You know, imagine how you feel coming back to Jesus after that. Man, things are great. This is awesome. This is amazing. And shortly thereafter, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, went up on the Mount of Transfiguration where the three disciples witnessed Jesus Transfigured and speaking with Moses and Elijah. <coughs> While all this was going on, meanwhile, kind of back at the ranch, the father had brought his demon possessed son to the remaining nine disciples and asked him to cast him out. You know, maybe he'd heard of this trip that they'd all made, and, and maybe he did, some relatives or somebody told him about what the disciples were doing. Maybe he thought Jesus was there and Jesus would take care of it, but in any case, you can almost imagine the disciples' response. <laughs> Bring it over. We got this. Done this countless times. Stand back, stand back. We got it. Demon, be gone. Nothing. Kids rolling around. <laughs> Demon, I command you to leave him. Worked last week. Thomas, come over here. You try it. I command you to leave him. Nothing. Kids rolling around. The key to the problem is at the end of the at the end of this passage. The disciples, you know, they've done this before. They cast out demons. They said, Jesus, why couldn't we cast out this demon? And Jesus replies. Well, you, you guys kind of forgot one key element of this whole process. In their overconfidence, they forgot to pray. Jesus said, this kind of one comes up by prayer. And I don't mean I don't think he means that there's a specific kind of demon that you have to pray about. I think it's more like this kind of thing, this kind of challenge, this kind of ministry has to be bathed, immersed in prayer. Only as we connect with the spiritual power on high, do we channel the spiritual power to take care of demons? And Jesus reminds his disciples that they're only effective when they're connected spiritually to the Father, a small fact that they've sort of forgotten, I think, in their, in their complacency. Another example is Peter on the night of the betrayal, Luke 22, 31 through 34. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked you to sift all of you as wheat, but I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the crowd rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you even know me. You see, Peter was supremely confident in his ability to take whatever came his way and to stand firm in his commitment to Jesus to the point where he actually put himself in the crosshairs by following Jesus into the courtyard where he was warming his hands with the, with the soldiers and when suddenly in the, out of the blue he's accused of being a follower of Jesus he folds up and he denies him three times that he even met him 
I think the disciples in the garden right before this give another example in Luke 22, 39 through 46. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. I'm not sure how much of this is actually overconfidence as much as maybe just a lack of awareness of the impending attack. You know, Jesus had told them the thing, that what was going to happen, but no doubt they'd been with Jesus any number of times in the garden, and Jesus goes off and pray, and they take the opportunity to get a little shut-eye. And this is probably just one more time like that. So Jesus goes off and prays, they get a little sleep, but I think if they had only known that in a matter of minutes, the soldiers and the guard would be coming to take Jesus into custody, I'm sure that they too would have been on their knees praying. The final, final thing I just want to mention is the warning that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, where he says to the Corinthians, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. He's saying, don't get overconfident. Don't get complacent, because that is a precursor to failure. Be ready for the temptations and challenges that will come, because if we survive the first shock, we'll find that God's provided the strength to endure and a path forward. You know, complacency, overconfidence, letting our guard down can be a foundation for failure because, well, it leaves us unprepared for the challenges. It leaves us unprepared for the trials. It leaves us unprepared for ministry opportunities like the casting out the demon. It leaves us unprepared for temptations when Satan comes against us as he did with Peter. So with that in mind, how can we evaluate our own posture and whether or not we're becoming a little bit overconfident, a little bit complacent. I think there's three ways that we can avoid becoming complacent in a Christian life. So the first one, primarily, first of all, foundational, we need to remain diligent in our prayer life. You know the old saying, there's no atheists in foxholes. When things get really bad, it drives people to prayer. Prayer is no problem in the bad times when we're just crying out, oh God, help me. It's when things are going great that often things begin to slide. You know, look at, look at Luke 22 passage and the different postures of the people involved. Jesus knew what was going to happen, and he was on his knees in anguish, sweating like drops of blood in his prayer to the Father to help get him through that. The disciples, they didn't realize it, and they were sleeping. Even though they didn't warn about it, they just didn't get it. They didn't understand you know, I, need, we, I think we need to pray daily for God to help us maintain this ongoing posture of readiness. And I think we also need to pray for insights into what God is doing in our lives. And by insights, I mean the ability, we, we need that ability to recognize God's involvement. I really think one day we're going to be in heaven and, and God's going to kind of lay out the whole thing for us and we're going to look at our life in the context of his involvement and we are going to be shocked at the level of detail of God's involvement in our lives. I don't think there's a day goes by that we don't experience His touch in our lives. But often, without the insider awareness, we either don't recognize it or sometimes we interpret it as uh, interruptions or even challenges. You know, there's a whole list of stories about people who missed being in the Twin Towers on 9-11 for one reason or another. Um, I'm reading them this week. One lady had a had a breakfast meeting scheduled with a couple of friends in the in the Twin Towers, and at the last minute, her mother decided to come down and visit. And the lady was kind of upset. We've had this thing set up this this breakfast meeting for so long, but and my mom's coming. Oh darn. Okay. And so she canceled the meeting, went to breakfast with her mom, and missed the Twin Towers. There's another guy, a story of another guy that just brought a brand new BMW. He was on his way to work and started doing something weird. And so he swung into the BMW dealer. He got there about 7 o'clock. And there were mechanics already there 
preparing for the day, but they refused to work on his BMW until eight o'clock when their shift started. So he sat there and fumed for an hour. And the, finally eight o'clock comes, it took about three minutes to fix his car, he says. Off he goes and he sees the smoke rising out of the Twin Towers as he's driving to work. There's all kinds of stories like that. You know, people that miss a, miss a flight because their, their original flight was, was delayed and they, they, they don't go down in the plane crash, all kinds of things. And I think, you know, some of these are big, major things. Some of them, you know, in very minor ways. I think God's involved in our lives all the time. And I really think that we just need to be praying that God help us to understand when you're touching our lives so that we don't get frustrated, so we don't push back, so we don't try to thwart the things that you are trying to do in our lives. The other thing that I think we need to do, we need to, we need to really adopt a posture of prayer. I think we also need to be diligent in addressing the sin in our lives. In 2014, Admiral William McRaven gave a commencement address to his alma mater, University of Texas, where he described his SEAL training. And he said, basic SEAL training is six months of long, torturous runs in the soft sand, midnight swims in the cold water off San Diego, obstacle courses, unending calisthenics, days without sleep, always being cold, wet, and miserable. It's six months of being constantly harassed by professionally trained warriors who seek to find the weak of mind and body and eliminate them from ever becoming a Navy SEAL. They seek to find the weaknesses and either eliminate those people or deal with the weaknesses that they have. The men and women that are undergoing SEAL training are being prepared to be the point of the spear, so to speak. And for that reason, if you're going to make the grade, you have to eliminate the weaknesses. They're ruthlessly called out. You know, I think it's a lot like us in, in, in our lives. You know, we don't, well, we don't think about it that much, but we are really involved in a battle that's just as real as anything the Navy SEALs go through. We're involved in a spiritual battle with the forces of darkness who want nothing more than to destroy us, to destroy our church, to destroy the work of God in this place. And any time we allow sin to exist in our lives, any time we allow this weakness to exist in our lives, where we're not pressing against it and trying to deal with it, we're giving the enemy leverage to use against us, to use against our families, to use against our church. You know, when everything's going well, it's easy to get a little bit flabby to let our diligence go lax. But when that happens, we need to remind ourselves that it may appear to be going well, but there's a battle raging all around us. A struggle with an unseen enemy who will exploit every spiritual weakness and every sin in our lives to bring us down. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. And I think one of the implications of this passage is that we have the tools to deal with sin in our lives. We don't have to allow it to exist. I mean, it'll always be with us, we'll always sin. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we can never reach perfection, but we can make progress in that direction. We have the tools, but it takes awareness, it takes diligence, it takes commitment, and it takes a rec recognition that no matter how smoothly things appear to be going, we are in a battle. And finally, we've got prayer, we've got diligence in dealing with the sin in our lives. I think the third way that we can overcome complacency is by remaining diligent in supporting and encouraging our brothers and sisters. And this recognizes the fact that we're all in this together. And that our primary resource, I believe fully that our primary resource that we have at our disposal that will enable us to finish this well is right here in this room with us. It's our brothers and sisters in Christ. Those people that help us, that encourage us, that keep us on track, to whom we're accountable that, uh, that just help us walk through this life and that, that we help walk through this life. You know, the author of Hebrews says, encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin and deceitfulness. And Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, encourage one another, build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. We need each other. I think that's why God instituted the church. 
and that's why he made the church the centerpiece for his strategy of kingdom expansion. We need encouragement when things go badly. We need the prayers of our brothers and sisters. We need the correction that people provide to us uh, when, when we take a wrong turn. We need the accountability that people provide. We need the growth that comes from our being the channel of those things to other people. You know, I think this is the biggest problem with people who conceptualize Christianity as kind of a solo adventure. Yeah, I don't need church. I've got my Bible. I can be with God anytime. I can I can pray. I don't I don't need a community in there. You know, I think there's probably a grain of truth to that, as long as things appear to be going well. But that kind of approach always <coughs> produces a half-baked, truncated form of Christianity, and it often leads to failure when things are not going well because we don't have the resources that we need, the interpersonal resources to succeed. So let me wrap this up. When I when I look at the ways to avoid complacency in our walk with Jesus, you know what? I think it really just boils down to who are we trusting? Are we trusting in ourselves and our own ability and our own capacity and our own education and our own economics and all the things that we have? Or are we trusting in Jesus? You know, the complacent put their trust in themselves as the as the Assyrians do. Hey, we've got a great city, it's fortified, we've got army, we've got, we got everything we need. <coughs> right up to the point that they did. And God used the devil and, and, uh, and the warning is not to follow their example. You know, we, we, can, we might have a great house, a good job, retirement plan, reasonable health, friends, resources. Ultimately, none of those are enough to bring us through the hard times. And for that, we need the spiritual resources that God provides. And to access those resources, we need to be diligent in our prayer life, asking God to intervene and protect us and give us the insight to know when he's doing those things so that we don't get across purposes what he's trying to accomplish. We need to be diligent in rooting out the sin in our lives. And we need to be diligent in our ministry of one another creating the kind of church that Jesus has called us to be. I think do that, and we'll be ready for whatever comes along. We'll be ready for whatever challenges, for whatever ministry opportunities, for whatever trials, and we'll be able to stand firm in the strength of Christ. Let's pray. Father, <coughs> forgive us for any times that we do get complacent when we especially those times when things seem to be going well, we're not facing any real challenges, and it's kind of easy to just slide a little bit. Lord, if we're doing that in our lives, point it out to us. Help us to realize that we are in battle, that we are in war, and that you've called us to be your army, your representatives, your ambassadors, taking your good news, strength, and power of your kingdom to the people around us. And Father, keep us from ever falling into complacency, but Help us through our prayers. Help us through our diligent uh, work to re remove sin from our lives. And help us in our uh, ministry to one another. To be the people you've called us to be. That one day we will achieve the goal of standing with you in heaven with our brothers and sisters, the people from our community whom you've touched. And uh, spend an eternity worshiping you. In the name of Jesus, we pray.